Hello. Start now. Hello, I'm Lauren Weymouth, and I'm with Ripple, a global financial technology company, and I'm broadcasting to you from my home office in San Francisco. It's an honor to be a part of this event. Thank you for joining us today to hear our panel discussion on Ubri panelists who are working towards using blockchain technology for climate change and biodiversity considerations. So I'd love if you'd all maybe throw a little symbol in the chat and let us know you're here today because you wanna learn more about blockchain. So let's get centered and grounded on the definition of blockchain. Blockchain is a distributed decentralized public ledger. And the good news is that it's easier to understand than that definition sounds, right? It's a, it records digital information, the block, stored in a public database, the chain, and they store information about transactions. And the most common use case is cryptocurrency, but we are studying and learning many other systems that can take advantage of private and secure and immutable record keeping like voting ballots, land management, measuring energy consumption. So I'm gonna give you an introduction to what the University Blockchain Research Initiative is, and that's how I know all the panelists here today. And because it's the Planetary Health Conference, I'll also share the commitment Ripple has made to joining the Crypto Climate Accord. And then we'll bring in our university partners who are excited to share with you the special, the social and environmental impact that this technology is having. And if you have questions, please throw them in the side chat. We have saved time at the end for Q&A. Okay, so just a little background on Ripple. Ripple's mission is to enable payments everywhere, every way for everyone. Using blockchain technology, we've built a global payments network to connect financial institutions around the world. And we're doing this to achieve the internet of value. Now in a world where moving value is as fast and seamless as information moves online today. I mean, it's curious that you can stream movies from a space shuttle, but it takes three to five days to wire your cousin overseas money and often will cost you 20 to $30 in bank fees. I mean, sometimes I think I could probably get on an airplane with a bag of cash and fly it to my cousin in Italy faster than I can with the old SWIFT system. So FinTech can lead finance towards the digital shift we've already seen as a result even of the pandemic. Blockchain is solving challenges right now in a crisis with contract tracing and supply chain. And while we have an opportunity to lead global finance with blockchain and digital assets, it's still early days. And that's why we're actively working to ensure that what we build today is scalable, sustainable, and built to last. And this calls for greater work and collaboration between universities and industry partners to accelerate research, adoption, innovation, and develop new talent to address the skills gap. This is a picture taken before the pandemic when I actually got to visit our campus partners. It's at, with a class of Waterloo engineers. Can you believe that 56% of the world's top universities have at least one blockchain or cryptocurrency course? So how are we addressing the skills gap at Ripple and how are we addressing inspiring innovation? Well, we recognize that academia is the backbone of innovation and most big tech have university relationships and they pay for sponsored research and they look for intellectual property, but Ripple's approach is different and that we give money away, allowing universities and partners to build what they want. Now, often partners will come to me and say, we wanna work on real world projects. What challenges are you facing? And then we roll up our sleeves with them and collaborate on tackling those challenges. And this is making it more interesting to help mature the ecosystem by partnering with faculty and students from leading engineering, business, law schools, humanities around the world, we can create a more open, dynamic and scalable FinTech ecosystem and solve the challenges of tomorrow. So in 2018, Ripple launched the University Blockchain Research Initiative to drive understanding and adoption in this space, including um, blockchain and cryptocurrency under the umbrella of FinTech. And what that looks like is support for academic research, technical development and curriculum design, conferences and student activities. Universities are free and clear to dictate how they apply these funds as long as it's under the FinTech umbrella. Uh, we encourage students and faculty to apply the funds to hire and train blockchain staff, build projects on ledger technology and host academic meetups with student groups and much, much more. And I think what's really fun to note is that this program was started because a Ripple engineer took the initiative to write a memo to le leadership. 
genius, right? That a $50 million program with 40 universities came out of a memo. I mean, what startup um, funds this kind of money to universities to speed up the development, to inspire breakthroughs instead of waiting for it to happen? I'm really proud of Ripple and it's one of the reasons I love working here. So you're gonna hear from examples of work being accomplished from three of our different university participants today, a banking finance expert joining us from University of Zurich, an architecture and design specialist from University of Pennsylvania and a leading engineer from USB. Also wanted to note some other, call out some other interesting projects from other partners. It's gone from philanthropy to business development. We're driving more relevant work on campus and off. National University of Singapore launched a FinTech lab where they worked with senior Ripple data scientists to research environmental impacts, consumption models, and sustainability of crypto. And I'll talk a little bit more about what they found in a minute. University College of London helped launch the Anapa COVID task force, convening key players in the global blockchain ecosystem to identify deployable solutions that address governmental, social, and commercial challenges caused by COVID. And then right here, blockchain and crypto are important research and study topics in Brazil because these technologies can form the building blocks of a new economy. FGV's Professor Rockman sees Blockman blockchain as creating new paradigms in business, economics that will empower Brazil's people, businesses, and even governments. They're committed to preparing Brazil's rising blockchain entrepreneurs and leaders with the university's cryptocurrency master's degree program, which was all funded by Uber. And students that hold Uber scholarships and fellowships, this is why we're in the school business. These are the next generation of talent. Another great example is Nisreen Bairanwala. She was an undergraduate student in computer science who won the Global Blockchain Olympiad competition. Now she's a graduate who started her own company called Vivica. She's creating blockchain solutions to solve for the overprescription and doctor shopping for the opioid crisis. Lauren, you're not sharing slides, just so you know. Ooh. Wow. Okay. I was just told that my slides were not sharing. So hopefully you can see these now. Thank you for that, Dorit. So when you combine a vision of the future with innovative technology and global collaboration across communities, you can achieve some very powerful results. In just two years, Uber has produced more than 250 research and technical projects, more than 150 modified FinTech courses, and has impacted more than 270 faculty, nearly 7,000 students around the world, and growing with each new cohort. We've launched a podcast called All About Blockchain to lower the barrier to the general public understanding what blockchain can do and how it will positively impact our future. It features leading global scholars discussing their applications, what challenges still need to be solved to bring it into the mainstream across various sectors. If you like what you hear today from Marco Simplicio and Dorit Aviv, you can catch their podcast interviews found on most major outlets like Apple, Spotify, and Google. And I'll drop a link into the chat um, we'll also have to interview you, Professor Pushman, in, the, in a future episode. So another way that we showcase our scholarly work is at Uber Connect. It's our annual academic convening and student hackathon. This is a quick video on the experience taken before the pandemic, and this year it will be held virtually October 11th and 12th. The University Blockchain Research Initiative, as we fondly call Ubery, is an initiative to get schools educating, adopting, innovating in blockchain, cryptocurrency, and fintech. So we formed this academic convening so that we could get everyone together in one space. Meeting all the uh, partner universities, it's stimulating activity across a lot of different boundaries. from the computer science to the economics to the policy. Getting all those people in one spot makes it really intellectually engaging. You guys as faculty and as students are really leading the way in helping to make these technologies a reality. I've really enjoyed the technical presentations, learning more about the issues that surround rolling out the internet of value. We've really felt a sense of legitimacy for our organization that comes with the Ripple name. 
The Uber gift is a way that we've been able to stabilize and really focus on building out our educational program. And we have to worry less about really trying to go out and do funding. The Uber has definitely given us more opportunities in terms of research in the blockchain space. We're pretty excited so far and we're excited on what's to follow. I love hackathons. I've been working on them my entire career. They're a super fun way to engage in the community. It's a great way to get feedback directly from people watching them build the products that you build. One thing that I got a lot of value out of is meeting people in the internet community. To actually see the people who I've been talking to online in person was really cool. We look for people that are curious, people that are not just looking for a job, but looking to change the world of how money moves. We need a network that's open. We need something that's truly open source and accessible like the internet is. The vision is the internet of value. Okay, so, and where, where are university partnerships? Everywhere, it's truly global, North America, South America, Asia, Europe, Africa, our partners, are also running XRP validators on campus. And these are nodes that power the consensus network of blockchain. They contain the full history of the ledger data since the beginning of time. And researchers are able to use the information in their work. They can also participate in voting on directions that the XRP ledger takes. Now this method of consensus is important because it is what makes the digital asset XRP green. The digital asset XRP was designed with sustainability in mind. It confirms transactions through a unique consensus mechanism and consumes negligible energy. That's less than it takes to run a small email server for a year. And all XRP currency is already in circulation. There's no new coins being minted. This is an interesting, this really highlights how negligible the energy uses is, especially in comparison to one of the more well-known coins, Bitcoin, which has very high energy consumption, almost unsustainable. So Ripple worked with Energy Web and Rocky Mountain Institute to create Energy Web Zero, an open source tool that enables any blockchain or host to decarbonize their network or node by purchasing renewable energy certificates from local providers around the world. Using EW0, XRP Ledger became the first major blockchain to decarbonize in October of 2020 and adding on to an already inherently green nature of the XRP Ledger. So today the crypto community is coming together as an industry to commit to the decarbonizing all blockchains in record time. Inspired by the Paris Climate Accord, the Crypto Climate Accord is hoping to bring together all parts of this industry to be the leader in sustainability. This is about getting the whole industry to 100% renewable and Ripple's proud to support the Crypto Climate Accord. Since launch, more than 40 companies and individuals spanning crypto and finance, technology, NGOs, energy and climate sectors have joined the Crypto Climate Accord as initial supporters, including Ripple. And we hope that the entire industry can come together to join the effort to decarbonize the blockchain industry and the world's energy system. So when it comes to addressing sustainability and global finance, fintechs have an opportunity to take the lead by taking steps such as reducing emissions, like making proof of work mining more efficient. Um, Bitcoin certainly is the biggest single blockchain in terms of energy emissions, but the accord is focused on decarbonizing the entire crypto industry, including all blockchains. Also offsetting carbon footprints by purchasing clean, renewable energy, building on low carbon and carbon neutral blockchains and engaging with developer communities and incentivizing building carbon neutral or net positive apps, features and transactions. So together we can create a more robust and sustainable global financial system and a healthier, more sustainable world. Now I'm going to bring on Thomas Pushman from the University of Zurich to tell you all about the project he's been working on within the Uber network. Thomas? Yeah, thank you very much, Lauren. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you uh, today, I'm sharing the screen with you now. Um, hope that this works. Um, so, maybe some, some words about myself. I'm the head of the Swiss FinTech Innovation Lab, uh, at uh, which we host a new in initiative on sustainable digital finance, which is supported by U Ubri, 
uh, which is really great uh, and al al allows us really to to uh, focus our re research more in intensively on how to leverage fintech and blockchain for sustainability goals. So um, maybe uh, some words about what we are doing there. One recent uh, research that we did was uh, identifying um, the whole startup landscape from a global basis um, and to see um, what is around there and what these projects are doing. And uh, although blockchain is often mentioned as a strategic technology to, to change entire business models, Empirical research on the topic, especially with the, with the impact on sustainability, um, is a research area which has not been discovered in more detail so far, despite some specific uh, case studies or more general overviews that, that you can read. While it has received some attention only in recent years, um, an empirical analysis, especially also on the implications and potentials, as well as a framework of what we can consider as re relevant for future research, is something that is still, still missing. Um, and uh, we can see that, or what, what, what we could observe when looking into these hundred startups that, that we identified here in, in the blockchain space uh, was that especially the energy and the financial services sector, as well as supply chains and government projects are the four major topics that uh, uh, we could see. And we, can, uh, we will come to some examples later on. Uh, but that was something that we could really observe there. We also took a deeper look at theory, as you can see here, identifying 35 uh, papers here, which is also not very much at the moment. Um, but they also look more or less at the same topics here, uh, which is in 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 interesting to see. So theory and practice uh, more or less share the same view here. Um, so that was uh, interesting to see, especially if you look at it from a, from a global perspective here. So uh, when we, um, what, what, one of the major issues, if you look into the sustainable finance field, especially, um, and how to make finance green, Lauren, you, you told that, is um, bring together the, the more long-term view of sustainability and the short-term view of profitability that uh, at the financial system and also the companies you usually have. So that, that is one of the biggest challenges. So that's uh, why we also had a closer look at the SDGs that are supported here. And they are not only uh, all focused on env envir environmental sustainability, which are the SDGs 6 to 7 and 12 to 15, but also look at the economic uh, part and also at social sustainability. Uh, but as you can see here, um, it is very much centered around industry, innovation, and infrastructure, around energy, around cities, uh, around partnerships. So these are the topics uh, that, that are in the focus of the, of the blockchain startups. Um, and also when you look in, in, into theory, that's what they currently uh, are, are focused on. So um, yeah, so that's basically uh, the uh, landscape that we could identify. And if you look now into the future, what could be uh, major topics for future research in, in that field? is um, one is, uh, which I already mentioned, is really bringing those um, maybe uh, that these, these two goals are aligning to these two goals of sustainability on the one hand side and profitability on, on, on the other hand, uh, which is not obvious um, because very often uh, profitability um, is on the, on the short term for focus, uh, while sustainability is more a, a long term goal. But uh, this is really one missing piece there. And that's very often is the availability of reliable data. If you look into supply chains, for example, um, including also financial data, which would then allow firms to measure and evaluate also business 
uh, and sustainability uh, benefits um, in, in common. Second, uh, the perspective on startups, uh, as we could see it is just a starting point for the field of uh, digital ecosystems as they currently evolve. And also the con configurations and business models as these firms are often integrated into a net network uh, of startups, but also of the incumbent firms. So uh, partnerships that are created there um, which we also can observe from the and, 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 and enterprise blockchain systems there that evolved over the past years. Um, that is clearly a trend that we can also see. Third, of course, uh, to, today there is a clear trend towards more operational efficiency optimization rather than really disruptive innovations. So the focus uh, very often is, uh, if you look into example into the energy sector, very often is of applying blockchains for improving the current system, um, rather than, uh, and that is also true for the startups at the moment, uh, to look really beyond the horizon, more on the disruptive innovations that are uh, ahead of us and that are more promising for the future. Fourth, which is a very interesting topic, is a novel aut autonomous distributed organizations and processes um, that also uh, might lead to innovative solutions um, and also uh, might be necessary uh, in the field of sustainability, or sustainability, such as, for example, cross country auditing and, and other fields, uh, especially when it comes to re reliable data and things like that. And fifth, of course, uh, novel ways of governance that are clearly re required, um, especially if you look into re reg regulation. Um, that has been discussed in the context of, of blockchain and sustainability. Uh, if you look at it uh, from both perspectives and also see that it touches various industries, it might become even more complex in the, in the future. So this is a very short uh, and brief all overview of, uh, of one, one of our re research topics besides many others. Um, and I'm happy to share many questions with you afterwards. But now I want to uh, hand over to Torrid directly, who will give uh, an overview um, over her project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Torres. Uh, let me share screen. Okay, can you see my screen okay, full view? Okay, great. So, um, hi everyone, it, it's great to be here as well. I'm uh, Dorit Aviv, I'm a faculty member at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, Weizmann School of Design. And I'm going to share with you um, a project called BlockPen, which is currently funded by uh, the Uber initiative that Lauren described before. Um, so what we were looking at in this project is uh, we want to answer some questions about um, the value of improvement of your individual environmental impact. How can you give it a value? And um, how can you give a value to, to improving your, um, your own environmental impact and your own environmental performance? Because we all want to be sustainable, right? That's probably true for everyone uh, joining this conference. But when it comes to actually measuring sustainability and environmental impact, um, certain things are harder to quantify and assign value to if you don't have the appropriate infrastructure to measure them. At the University of Pennsylvania, students and faculty uh, members and staff have come to us. Um, I, I specifically uh, work, at, I have um, a lab called the Thermal Architecture Lab and I work with the uh, Center for Environmental Building Design, and they asked us, how can we, um, how can we measure our own uh, energy performance? Uh, how do we know how much energy we're using on campus in relation to others, um, in relation to the space that we inhabit? Um, many people, I think in general, share this desire to be responsible and improve their environmental footprint but don't actually have the tools to even evaluate how they're doing. 
So in this project, we're looking at the Penn campus and we ask how can we evaluate how much energy each person is using in each space? What is their carbon footprint and how can it be improved? Moreover, can we create a system that incentivizes improvement by giving people reward for, um, for their uh, individual um, improvement over time? So to do this, we created BlockPen. It's a scalable blockchain network which connects a suite of IoT sensors to measure environmental parameters at the scale of rooms on campus um, and provides an estimate of personal energy performance of users. By using blockchain, we're able to use smart contracts to reward users with a point system that we call the pen coin. The pen coin is meant to incentivize reducing personal energy consumption. Essentially, we're tokenizing something that is usually hard to quantify, your own personal environmental or energy performance. We're thus able to put value on energy savings, meaning if you reduce your environmental footprint, you receive rewards. To get a bit into how the system works, we use Raspberry Pis as um, the, uh, to, to contain the nodes, the blockchain nodes. Um, Raspberry Pis are powerful but inexpensive microcontrollers. Each Raspberry Pi is, Pi is placed in a room on campus and contains a blockchain node. A suite of sensors is then uh, connected to, to the Raspberry Pi. Those include energy sensor, artificial light and daylight sensors, different types of air quality sensors, which is something that's very important today, and thermal sensors. They're all connected to this central um, node. And then an algorithm is used to assess the performance of that, uh, of that space based on these several variables. And then based on that algorithm, a pen coin is assigned uh, through a smart contract, depending on whether you're um, above or below uh, average compared to your peers and compared to your um, previous performance. Now, this work is very much ongoing right now. We just started deploying these nodes on campus after building the infrastructure, and we have a dashboard that we use to track both sensor data and the pen coin transactions. Um, I just want to end with um, this slide. You can find more info about this project. Um, um, and, um, and also contact us. Um, and this is uh, the block pen team. Um, and thank you. I'm going to stop uh, sharing now and um, transfer the um, stage to uh, Marcos. Thank you, Dorit. I will share my screen now soon. If everything is going on well. You should be seeing it now. Well, just uh, quick introductions here. I'm uh, Professor Marco Simplicio. I'm from the uh, Universidade de São Paulo, who is hosting virtually, but hosting the, uh, the, the uh, fun uh, meeting. So uh, what I want to talk about today is about this Amazon 4.0 and blockchain. Uh, combination that led to what we call the Amazon Biobank. So I try to make uh, one slide here that tries to summarize everything. Uh, basically, the Amazon Biobank project, it is part of this bigger initiative called the Amazon 4.0, uh, which is led by the climatologist uh, Carlos Nobre. Uh, most of you probably know about him. He also had some participation in this, this conference. Uh, the goal of the Amazon 4.0 initiative is to promote economic acti activities in the forest that are both uh, sustainable and profitable. I mean, this contrasts with the two usual approaches for the economical exploration of the Amazon forest. Uh, the, the first, that's more traditional, say, uh, focuses basically on the preservation of the forest. Uh, and then it takes advantage of uh, the indirect benefits of the, the, the forest, like rain production, uh, which is important for the agribusiness, uh, for example, which is a big economic asset uh, of Brazil, and also on uh, some low technology and also low profit activities like uh, fruit extraction, like Brazilian nuts, uh, acai, and uh, well, 
this is one way of doing things, but it does not really create a big economy in the region. And that's why some people tend to go to the second, uh, which has unfortunately been growing approach, which involves uh, indiscriminate extraction of wood and mining in the region. Uh, the result is obviously not good at all in terms of uh, sustainability. Uh, it promotes deforestation, uh, generation of profit that does not really stay in the region. Uh, and in the end, it's uh, not the best way of doing things. And uh, those, those extracting goods, uh, actually, they, uh, the, those that stay in the forest extracting those goods, they get the smallest part of the profit. So uh, really, in terms of economy, it's not the best way to go. So what the Amazon 4.0 project promotes is a third venue. And uh, the idea is to add value to products from a standing forest using technology for this, this purpose, uh, blockchain being one of them. Uh, in the particular case of the biobank, the goal is to benefit from one of the main assets of the Amazon rainforest, that is its uh, biodiversity. In, in summary, the idea, as shown in the, the slide, is to tokenize the forest's uh, biodiversity. Blockchain is a very good technology for doing that. And uh, the project itself, what it tries to do with this tokenization is that uh, local communities could extract DNA data from local plants, insects, bacteria, for example, and then register this data in a blockchain to ensure the ownership of this, this data as the collectors of this data. So the raw DNA data can then be processed in a collaborative manner, meaning that anyone with a computer around the world and interested in investing some computation in this task could do it. Uh, it could be you and me, for example. Uh, and it's more or less like mining Bitcoin, but uh, instead of generating heat, the computation power would be generating uh, valuable information that is this uh, DNA, processed DNA that can be used for research, for example. Uh, the data can also be stored and distributed uh, collaboratively using peer-to-peer -peer technologies like uh, BitTorrent. So it's really uh, a matter of bringing everyone together, many technologies with collaborative, uh, collaborative properties into helping the Amazon forests. And then when someone buys the DNA data, the whole chain of collaborators is uh, remunerated, including those that collected, processed it, and distributed the data. Uh, the buyers are expected to be researchers from academia working on fields like biology, uh, pharmaceutics, chemistry, and food engineering, for example, and also biotechnology industries uh, from those same fields. Anyone that works with DNA as part of the uh, chain of value could use this data. And as long as they accept the terms of use of this data, which is should be regulated by smart contracts that are also registered in the blockchain, that, that should be fine. Uh, then uh, any product generated from this data, like new drugs, cosmetics, catalysts for chemical processes, uh, they could lead to royalties uh, for those local communities, for example. Uh, so they can profit in the long run, not only once, uh, not only when they extract the data. It's like uh, turning the local communities from the Amazon forest into biotechnology entrepreneurs, say. And actually, they would profit while helping uh, humanity itself uh, with this biodiversity-related information. Uh, just to give a concrete example, in 2018, Brazilian researchers discovered that some microorganisms from the Amazon forest produce some enzymes that can increase the production of biofuel by up to 50%. So it's enabling this kind of discovery that is one of the main goals of this, this biobank when it goes online. Today, it's mostly uh, we are designing the system, uh, picking the technologies together, testing them. Uh, we hope to have something to be uh, tested as a proof of concept, at least by 2022. And this is a small share of the, the team that is working on this idea. There is the, the technical and engineering part with uh, I am part of uh, with Professor Teresa also from the University of Sao Paulo. There are those more into the biology aspects of the project, also very important uh, because the application itself 
involves this kind of knowledge, like uh, Bruno de Medeiros and Ismael Nobre. And there are also economy uh, people working with how this whole ecosystem could really create value for the Amazon forests. And it's not here, but uh, we have a link uh, for further information. Uh, we also have help from legal teams to make sure we are not doing anything that uh, goes against the Brazilian legislation on the uh, how DNA data from the forest is handled. So uh, this is what I, I had to present today. Please use the link that is there for further information and our contact info if you are interested in collaborating with the idea somehow. Thank you. And I would like to give back the word to Lauren so she can continue with the presentation, please, Lauren. Well, even Marcus, before you jump off stage, you told us that you're working towards a prototype in 2022. What else is the current state of the development of the biobank? And could you share maybe a little bit about your timeline for entering into the production stage? Okay, yes. Well, uh, right now we are focusing mostly on two things. First, trying to get everything up, uh, testing technologies uh, with those engineers that are there. This is the part I'm, I'm more uh, into, like that, that's my area of knowledge, trying to make everything uh, work with a good performance and securely, mostly. And also there are the people working with the, uh, the environment in terms of uh, the, the biology part, like getting partners from the Amazon first, that's really important, universities, um, uh, NGOs, and uh, even groups, local groups. That, are, that may be interested in participating with this, collecting the data. Uh, without such engagement, the project cannot fly at all. And uh, we hope to have this prototype so people that are, uh, are uh, willing to engage into it uh, can work with the, this data, actually seeing the DNA data going into a bank and they can like consult what is there by the end of 20. 2022 most likely uh, because the, the technologies themselves are, are really <laughs> somewhat hard to tame. There are many steps to to uh, to really create the whole ecosystem, but uh, that's that's the idea. By the end of 2021, we should have this prototype. 2022, we should have it online and the first DNA data getting into along the year. That's the idea. If everything goes well, yeah, I'm an optimist. I'm just going to keep asking questions until I see questions in the chat, but please feel free to, this is an open forum now, um, ask anything, I guess you're welcome to pop stuff in there. Um, Thomas, um, what, where do you see the greatest potential for future research? You gave us a uh, general ideas of five topics that you're looking to cover, but where do you see the, the, the greatest potential? Well, there, I think there are uh, two uh, major directions. One is more on the technology side, of course. Um, so uh, you, you also mentioned some with uh, more energy efficient consensus protocols, interoperability among hedgers and things like that. So that's something we also could see in the, uh, in the example now from the, from the rainforest. Uh, I think these are very in, in, important parts. The other thing is more on the on the bu business side, which very much kind of connects them to it. So uh, really finding uh, cases for that. Um, there was an, an, an article around uh, a few years ago or, already, which termed the... Uh, um, uh, is is every, everything really uh, uh, applicable to to blockchain? And does blockchain make sense for everything? Of course not. Uh, so finding the right applications for that from a business perspective, I think, is a very important point, especially when you look into into the sustainability domain. Um, things like uh, token-based financing platforms, uh, things things like that. So I, th I think these are very Im Im important parts. So, so connecting these two streams, technology and business, um, I think is an important way for the future. That's great. And then turning to Dorit, um, you know, it's interesting. We've kind of heard a thread between all of these projects and presentations about the ability to rem remunerate good behavior, right? With the pen coin, being able to um, 
pay out uh, good actors that are using low energy or um, Marcos with the rainforest project being able to pay those that are collecting the data. Um, Dorit, can you use the system to access your personal carbon footprint? How would you do that? Right, so yeah, and just to um, emphasize like at this point, uh, the Pencoin is just a point system, but um, it, it's used as an incentive. Um, but um, yeah, so um, the, the interesting thing is that what we're measuring in the project is um, the energy usage in the room in relation to how the room is occupied and certain other certain parameters like uh, are you using um, artificial lights when you don't need to because there are um, there there's daylight so you you could you know you could potentially just open the wind or open the blinds and have enough light and not use artificial light so we're not just measuring the energy um, output we're also measuring certain parameters of how long do you actually spend in the room etc to create an evaluation. But then when you're talking about carbon footprint, uh, that's, that's the next step of taking that um, ener energy um, factor. We, we call it, we call it um, energy use in, usage in, intensity. It's a very, uh, very widely used variable. Um, but then look at it in relation to carbon footprint means you're multiplying that by um, a certain factor, which is based on what is the what is the energy source, right? So, if there's um, if 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 the grid is using a certain uh, energy source um, uh, that is uh, uh, fossil fuel based or versus um, renewable energy, it would actually have a different carbon footprint, which makes everything more interesting because then when you're using energy in a certain time of the day you would have a lower footprint because you have more of a renewable energy available versus others. So we're not, you know, we're, we're not doing that yet, but that's the potential. I think it's a really interesting potential of the project is to connect the energy performance and the individual energy performance to the actual carbon footprint. You perfectly answered my next question was, what, what is the next step for the project? Um, switching back to Marcos, uh, I think a great way to end this panel would be to maybe suggest what what about regulations that apply to DNA data that you're planning to connect? Are there any legal issues um, in that field? Yeah, actually, we uh, I'm I'm I did not know much of the field until recently uh, with uh, a presentation from its uh, Instituto Escolha, it's a Brazilian institute like Choice uh, Institute. They uh, gather some some people from that, that work with biodiversity with DNA data, and they <laughs> kind of show uh, have shown lots of issues that people face with the Brazilian legislation today, without this this platform uh, yet existing, uh, to access this this data. Well, the idea of the, the legislation is to avoid biopiracy. So it does make sense to have a legislation around it. And uh, the way that is, it's done kind of passes through uh, this uh, CISGEN system. It's a Brazilian system where you have to uh, register yourself and the data can be accessed only after that. Uh, some problems that exist is that they are basically made for Brazilians. So it's hard to actually collaborate with people all around the world that may be interested in this data. And even if they are researchers collaborating with Brazilian people, uh, it may be complicated to, to do this. And uh, actually this, this, um, this panel with uh, Instituto Escolha, uh, they did show uh, examples of people that wanted to collaborate, but they could not just because of the system. So uh, I got aware of these things afterward, but the, the guys that are on the biology side are well aware about it for, for a long time. And they already planted a few things that need to go into the system specification. Like uh, it has to somehow talk with the system system at some point. Uh, the current legislation will require that. And also, uh, at some point, we may be able to help with uh, bridging this difficulty of people from outside Brazil accessing the system if we can like uh, work as, uh, 
um, say, authentication and identification uh, platform uh, where collaborators that are registered with us could have easier access to this citizen system that itself, even without the blockchain helping people to get collect the data should help uh, to develop the research on this area. So that, that's what we are looking into also. I mean, for, for, the, produ for the production phase uh, that necessarily will have to, to be well uh, fine-tuned and it's something we are well aware of. Well, it sounds very interdisciplinary, right? There's clear room for policy experts on your project. Um, I think we're at time. Thank you for all the speakers for participating today and for all those who came to join us and hear more about uh, what we're building on top of blockchain. Thank you for being here.